It's time to be about that life, the startup life. Here's your host, Dominic Lawson. All right, Startup Nation, I hope you're ready to receive some value today. My name is Dominic Lawson. That's G on the ones and twos. This is the Startup Life presented by DR and Associates. DR and Associates providing real clients with real results. And today, Startup Nation, we have an amazing guest, nonprofit leader, nonprofit expert. She is the president and CEO of Bancroft, one of the largest human services provider in the New Jersey and greater Philadelphia region. And she has doubled it in size in uh, in uh, her company in 10 years. She's also one of the 50 most influential people in South Jersey about South Jersey biz in 2015 and a who's who in healthcare in South Jersey in 2017. She is a first time author of the book we're going to talk about today, Too Important to Fail, Leadership Lessons for Nonprofits. She is the one and only Miss Tony Pergolin. Miss Tony, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. Hi, Dominic. All right. Are you ready to pour some knowledge in Startup Nation today? I am. I am. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. So let's kind of hop right into it. So if you would, Tony, kind of share with us your origin story uh, of your career up until this point. Sure. So I I am an accounting major, which is is an important part of my story because I came out of college as a business person. Okay. And I I got into nonprofit pretty early in my career. Um, I worked for um, a big health system in Philadelphia. And, you know, I was there for 15 years, always on a finance track, but mm. really learned the operations and how successful businesses ran. About after 15 years, I worked in multiple roles, learned a lot at the health system. I was ready for the next step, and I really just wanted to be a CFO. Like, it was my background, a chief financial officer. Right. And I really just wanted to come to an organization and be the chief financial officer. So when I got the call to come to Bancroft as the CFO, I was very excited about it. I knew nothing about the organization. I didn't know about the important work that it did. I didn't know that it was 125 years old then. I didn't know that people truly depended on this organization. I didn't know that it helped people with autism and uh, intellectual developmental disabilities and brain injuries. I knew none of that. All I knew was that it was having some financial challenges. And right. I knew that from looking at the financial statements. But I wasn't I wasn't afraid of that because I had done some turnaround work at, when I worked in the health system. For and sure. I thought this is this is what I do. But when I got here, I realized pretty quickly that it was way worse than anybody knew. And what what I jumped into really right away was call after call after call from vendors saying, you know, from the utility companies saying, if you don't pay us some money, we're going to have to cut off all the utility services. Wow. And then the health, the health insurance company is saying, if you don't pay us something, we're going to have to cancel all the insurance for your employees. I mean, it was really in that state, this cash, um, you know, cash was precarious at best, and we really lived payday to payday. So in, in, in addition to all these calls, you know, every other Friday is payday, whether you're ready or not. Right. And um, so it was really, really challenging um, for the first six months. Um, we had to make some really hard decisions. We had to close some programs. We had to outsource some issues. Um, you know, I had a board who uh, wasn't totally aware and understood the situation. Uh, so it was, it was I, I felt a sense of responsibility to the people that we serve and their families. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, I, I got through it after 18 months. I was fortunate to have a board member who was able to make me loans <clears throat> and significant donations that gave me time. <clears throat> One of the things I learned is it really takes time. You know, you can make a change today, but you don't see the impact of that decision or that change over time. So I needed some time to really turn it around, and I was fortunate to have a partner in that. And so after 18 months, we were able to stabilize. You know, we looked at bankruptcy, we looked at mergers, we looked at all that stuff. And just from really a good business sense, we were able to turn it around. Over the next 10 years, I doubled the size of the company. So we went from turnaround mode to growth mode and really had a vision to build a brand new school that I knew from a business perspective was going to be critical to our future. 
So Absolutely. two years ago in January, we opened a $75 million beautiful state-of-the-art organization. So in a 12-year period, we went from the edge of bankruptcy to um, a very successful vision and, and future for the organization. That's Absolutely. it in a nutshell. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And that's definitely why uh, we wanted to talk to you today, Tony, because here in Memphis, we have a lot of nonprofits and they have definitely a lot of challenges, a lot of the challenges that you're talking about. Uh, that you had with Bancroft and stuff like that. So I'm really excited about uh, having you on today. And Startup Nation, uh, the book is Too Important to Fail, uh, a a lesson, I'm sorry, leadership lessons for nonprofits. Uh, And so, Tony, I wanted to ask you this, because I know this is your first book, but kind of talk about, you know, uh, what made you write your book? Because I know, you know, when, when I was reading the book, you was talking about like you're not really, uh, you're you're all about business, you're all about numbers. You kind of talked about that a little bit, but kind of talk about like what was that point? Like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and write this book. You know, it, it's a great question, and be, because I'm 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 not a word person, I'm I'm a numbers person, and you know, after the turnaround and when I really started um, to be able to get out, if you will, right? And, um, you know, in the community and really network because I was really wanted to build awareness around Bancroft. And I would tell people my story, you know, and they'd say like, wow, like you should write a book. And I said, well, I mean, what I did, you know, there's a lot of people that do, you you know, we're business people. We turn around companies. All, this happens every day. Why is it a story? And the more people I talked about, they said, you know, but there's something about Bancroft. There's something about turning around an organization that's been around for you know, a uh, hundred plus years right. that is so important to people. Like, where would these people go? And, you know, I really, so I started to think about that and I thought, you know, maybe it's an opportunity for me to really talk about um, my, my, you know, passion around nonprofits overall. Cause I think there's a lot of myths out there. Mm. And I thought, you know, maybe I could use this book to really help people understand not only the important work Bancroft does, but the important work that nonprofits do and that there's a way that everybody can truly help them if, you know, you can really make a difference in a nonprofit if that's what you're looking for. And so with that, I thought, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and do this. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. So we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to dive into the book a little bit. We're going to talk about that first Bancroft day uh, that you experienced there, Tony, for sure. You're listening to The Start of Life on KWAM The Voice, AM 990, 107.9 FM. Startup Nation, we tell you all the time that no one does anything great on their own. That includes starting a business or a nonprofit or even becoming a thought leader or an influencer. My point is that you need a team to do it successfully and responsibly. And that is why you should contact DR and Associates. Danielle and her team provide branding solutions along with digital and social media marketing that provide tangible results you are looking for. No matter if you are a Fortune 500 company or an author looking to make an impact, DR and Associates needs to be part of your team. They are one of the few firms whose leadership has been recognized by Google, which is proof of concept that they are very good at what they do. Contact DR and Associates today to grow your online presence. The number is 615-933-3681 or you can visit their website at drandassociates.com. Also, make sure you follow their Facebook page as well, DR and Associates, providing real clients with real results. This episode of The Startup Life is also brought to you by our amazing partners at SCORE Memphis. Look, entrepreneurship is hard, and there is nothing like a mentor that can help you navigate those waters. And that is what SCORE provides. SCORE mentors provide years of expertise and have resources that will have you flourishing and profitable on your path to entrepreneurship. If you are in need of a mentor, give SCORE a call. The number is 901-544-3588 or go to their website at memphis.score.org. The link is there in the show notes. Startup Nation, Kenda and I, along with our daughter Zoe, have this thing called Target Fridays if she's had a good week at school. We stop by the snack bar for popcorn and mermaid ices. Startup Nation, don't judge me until you've tried them. Those ices are really good. Anyways, we then head over to the toy section so my daughter can add to her LOL doll collection. My daughter is a pretty good student, so you can imagine that we have spent a small fortune on LOL dolls. However, 
I can take solace in the fact that Target makes it affordable to buy those LOL dolls and anything else we need as a family. That's because Target believes you deserve quality at an affordable price. And when you're entrepreneurs like us, that's extremely important. But great deals and quality products are not exclusive to the brick and mortar version of the retail store. Target.com has even more exclusive deals that you can appreciate. And when you spend over $35, shipping is free. And I know we all love free shipping. We love to purchase the amazing kids clothes for Zoe from the exclusive to Target Cat and Jack line when we go online. So the next time you listen to the show and you are reminded that you need something for your home, Start your target journey with the link in our show notes where you can expect more and pay less. We are back with the startup life and we're talking to our guest, Tony Pergolin, president and CEO of Bancroft. And we're going to talk about her book, Too Important to Fail. As you can see, if you're watching live on Facebook, on the Startup Life uh, podcast f- Facebook page or the KWM The Voice Facebook page, you can see we have a copy of the book here uh, here in the studio, thanks to our good friends at Smith Publicity. So, Tony, I want to ask you this, because in the book, you start off, uh, it's you've been at Bancroft for about a year now, and you go to your first Bancroft day, and you're talking yeah. to the parents, and you're talking to the people <clears throat> that you serve Tell me what's going through your mind, because keep in mind, you know, Startup Nation, Tony knows what's going on with the with the, <laughs> the organization, but the the family and the people that they serve, not necessarily so much. So talk about right. that, that, you know, that juxtaposition, if you would, uh, Tony. Yeah. And it was it, it was truly, um, you know, a, a whole change in my and in, in my thinking around the organization. So, mm-hmm. as you said, I had been there uh, for about a year and I was really, um, you know, chained to my desk, if you will, because I was just trying to, you know, navigate all these, this cash crisis and get some people money and fix the billing so we'd get cash in. I mean, I really only knew the organization by the numbers. Absolutely. So I didn't know any of the people we served. I knew how much we got paid for them, but I didn't know them at all. Right. So I was really caught up in, in, in working and, but, but, at that point, I pretty much knew um, that we most likely were not going to make it. So I was talking to bankruptcy lawyers. I was talking to other organizations about potential mergers. Right. And I was very focused on something called a warn letter mm. because I learned from my bankruptcy lawyer that if I thought we were going to miss payroll 60 days out, we had to send a letter to every employer and say, or every employee, and say, we're going to miss payroll, so that they at least were aware that they weren't going to get the money that they were probably counting on. And so I was always counting, like, you know, we were had 58 days cash on hand, and, you know, we were going to make it 58 days, and then we were going to make it, you know, 52 days, and then we we're going to make it 59 days. So mm-hmm. I, that was the mode I was in. In this, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have to bankrupt. We're gonna close. We're gonna merge. I'm gonna sign a more a war, send out warn letters. Right. When somebody came to me and said, Tony, you really should come to Bancroft Day. This is something we do every year, where all the people that we serve come out, their families come, their staff come. It's really a great day. And I said, you know what? I probably should. I know nothing about this organization. And it was on a Saturday. I remember it was a fall day. And it was held on our campus, which was beautiful. There's trees. You know, we'd been there for 120 years. So right. it was a beautiful 20 acres. And I was walking around, and it really struck me how happy everybody was. Mm. Truly happy. The families were happy. The person served. There was all these activities. The staff were there. The staff brought their own families. Like it was this truly family environment and everybody was happy. And I thought, oh my God, I'm the only one that knows wow. that we might close. I'm the only one that knows that I'm talking to bankruptcy lawyers. I'm the only one that knows that this staff are going to get a letter soon that says we're going to miss payroll and all these families are going to get a letter that says you got to come pick up your child. Right. Tony, and if you, it, I'm it sorry. was surreal. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. It was, just, it was a surreal feeling about, wow, these people have no idea what's really happening. Like I was the only one and it was a really surreal feeling. Right. Right. I, I want to ask a quick follow. I didn't mean to cut you off earlier, but I wanted, no, to, okay. I, I wanted to ask you a quick follow up because there has to be a lot of weight on your shoulders, right? But also at the same time, 
a, a, a renewed sense of purpose for Bancroft and the mission and to make sure it, 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 you know, that you, you turn it around. Kind of talk about that a little bit, if you would. Yeah. So, you know, when I went, when I came to Bancroft as the CFO, all I wanted to do was be a CFO. That, that was the only thing I thought about. Right. And, you know, as I mentioned, I did have the financials and I knew that they were, you know, having some challenges. And I remember showing them to my husband. My husband's a banker. And he looked at these and said, you know, they might have to go through a bankruptcy. And I was like, won't that be cool? I'm a CFO. Right. You know, it, to me, it was all about the numbers. Mm. Until and, and when I went to that Bancroft day, I thought, oh, my God, this is not an accounting p- problem. Right. You know, this isn't, you know, the, the you know, where, where I'm just trying to figure out, you know, the, the answers to, to a complex problem. These are people's lives. These are people who truly need this organization. And I met family after family, and they would say things like, you know, my child, I was told he would never, Mm. you you know, graduate. He would never speak. He would never live a normal life. And here they were. You know, their children are going to proms. Their children are going to, you know, a Special Olympics. They graduated from, from, you know, with, with a cap and gown, with a diploma. And they had jobs. Like, I was like, oh my gosh, this place really is too important to fail, which of course is the name of my book because it sure. really struck me that I have to go back on Monday and think very differently about how I'm leading. Like this is no longer about how we close. It's more about how do I make sure this place is always here. For sure. So it was a turning point. For sure. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. And the reason I wanted to ask you that, Tony, is because a lot of times we talk uh, on the startup life about, look, sometimes when you're running a company, it's not always just about you. Like, true enough, you know, you're, you dive into the numbers, as you would say, you have always been a, a numbers person. I read that you and your mom were a numbers person, yes, uh, yes. And, you know, always, you know, fascinated by business and stuff like that. But sometimes our businesses and our companies or in this case, our nonprofits are more than just that. So I'm, I'm so glad that you shared that story. Yes. For thank sure. You. For sure. And so with that being said, when you talk about Bancroft Day, one of the things I love that you do in the book um, is, you know, you not only talk about the turnaround and stuff like that, but you also share some of those stories as well. It's almost kind of like a, a nice break away from, you know, like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen next with the cash on hand and the receivables <laughs> and stuff like that. But you, you also uh, provide the audience with the human element of the stories as well. Kind of share with your strategy as far as like sharing those stories in the book as well. Yeah, so you know, it, it, it's a turn, right? So it's a leadership book. So for sure, it's about the turnaround and the growth and all that. Right. But I also wanted to use the book to allow people to understand why I was so driven to make this work. And it was about those stories, right? And, and I really wanted to make people aware of, you know, why those people were so important to me. And when you, you know, when I, when I met them, and, you know, the, the first story in there um, was somebody who I met early on. He was the uh, chairman of our finance committee, right? So, you know, all of our board members are, of course, volunteering their time. And I remember meeting him, and, you know, we were both Penn State grads, and mm-hmm. we were both finance people. And, you know, like, I thought, man, this guy's like me. And as I got to know him, I thought, you know, Joe, like, I know why I'm here because I, at Bancroft because I want to be a CFO. But why are you? You know, you work for this big accounting firm, you're a partner, you travel. Like, why would you volunteer your time at this organization? Right. And that's when he told me about Casey, his daughter, who, you know, he said, dropping my daughter off at five years old was the hardest day of my life. Mm. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I have two two children myself. And I thought, oh my God, I couldn't even fathom, right? That that dropping your child off for five, at five years old to live with other people because you couldn't take care of them. And it really hit me. Like you always think that these things happen to other people not like you, you know? It's right, absolutely. Things happen to people not like you. And I thought, oh my God, he's just like me. And it really can, you know, impact a lot of people's lives. And so I just thought it was important to share those stories so people understood 
why I was so driven to make sure that that Bancroft was, you know, positioned for a successful future. For sure. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I want to ask you this, because I want to kind of dive into the turnaround plan just a little bit before we go to break mm -hmm. here, because, you know, you, you, you put systems in place, you, you know, uh, that were not in place before. Uh, but one of the decisions that I found interesting in the book was when you decided to kind of transition uh, the business office over to one of the receivables or the collection agencies, you know, right. that you uh, right. were, had contracted to hire to kind of help with receivables and stuff like that. Talk about that decision and talk about, you know, because I imagine the people who are in the business office, like felt a little bit of kind of betrayal or hurt or something like that. Kind of talk about that decision. Cause I know it wasn't an easy one. It, it was not easy, but right. you know, I had been there, um, for probably about six months at that point, and I tried multiple things. So I had hired consultants, and I hired new managers, and like, I, but I didn't have a, a a big runway, so I needed immediate impact. Absolutely. And I, I had hired this collection agency, you know, as as a part of another, you know, solution. So I had a manager, I had a consultant, and I had this collection agency. And I thought, well, between the three of them, they can figure this out. You know, and the collection agency was just focused on the old stuff. But what I learned was that the the business office funding mechanisms had become so complex that our systems really weren't up to up to speed on what the the funders needed. And Although the people were so well intentioned, the the complexity had just you know we needed some different skill levels that we couldn't recruit real quick gotcha. to really kind of help them move forward. And this collection agency woman came to me and said, "Listen, I'm here. I'm seeing what's going on. I can do this for you." And and I thought, you know what? I'm running out of ideas. You know, I've, I had tried so many things and right. I wasn't making a quick impact. And so I thought, you know what? I trust her. She's made, you know, she had done some good work there. And and I said, but what about all these people that have done so good? And she said, I'll hire them. They can work for me and I can, I can train them and I can add other skill sets. And that's how I kind of got by that. I and mean, it was still really hard. Absolutely. And, you know, to this day, you know, those people work so hard at Bancroft for so long, but I do believe that we had it, we had to do something or we just weren't going to be here. And it's one of those really hard decisions that if you can come back to what's right for the organization, what's right for the people we serve, what's right to make sure this organization is always here, I, that that's how I got through that really difficult decision. Absolutely. And it, 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 you really highlight the point of like, at the end of the day, the mission is what matters for sure. And I appreciate yeah. you sharing that for sure, Tony. So we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how mother nature try to kind of stymie the turnaround, <laughs> but also how a, a, a particular family was very important to the Bancroft story. You're listening to the startup life on KWAM, the voice. Startup Nation, we tell you all the time that no one does anything great on their own. That includes starting a business or a nonprofit or even becoming a thought leader or an influencer. My point is that you need a team to do it successfully and responsibly. And that is why you should contact DR and Associates. Danielle and her team provide branding solutions along with digital and social media marketing that provide tangible results you are looking for. No matter if you are a Fortune 500 company or an author looking to make an impact, DR and Associates needs to be part of your team. They are one of the few firms whose leadership has been recognized by Google, which is proof of concept that they are very good at what they do. Contact DR and Associates today to grow your online presence. The number is 615-933-3681, or you can visit their website at drandassociates.com. Also, make sure you follow their Facebook page as well. DR and Associates, providing real clients with real results. This episode of The Startup Life is also brought to you by our amazing partners at SCORE Memphis. Look, entrepreneurship is hard, and there is nothing like a mentor that can help you navigate those waters. And that is what SCORE provides. SCORE mentors provide years of expertise and have resources that will have you flourishing and profitable on your path to entrepreneurship. If you are in need of a mentor, give SCORE a call. The number is 901-544-3588 or go to their website at memphis.score.org. The link is there in the show notes. Startup Nation, Kenda and I, along with our daughter Zoe, have this thing called Target Fridays if she's had a good week at school. We stopped by the snack bar for popcorn and mermaid ices. Startup Nation, don't judge me until you've tried them. Those ices are really good. Anyways, 
We then head over to the toy section so my daughter can add to her LOL doll collection. My daughter is a pretty good student, so you can imagine that we have spent a small fortune on LOL dolls. However, I can take solace in the fact that Target makes it affordable to buy those LOL dolls and anything else we need as a family. That's because Target believes you deserve quality at an affordable price. And when you're entrepreneurs like us, that's extremely important. But great deals and quality products are not exclusive to the brick and mortar version of the retail store. Target.com has even more exclusive deals that you can appreciate. And when you spend over $35, shipping is free. And I know we all love free shipping. We love to purchase the amazing kids' clothes for Zoe from the exclusive to Target Cat and Jack line when we go online. So the next time you listen to the show and you are reminded that you need something for your home, Start your Target journey with the link in our show notes, where you can expect more and pay less. All right, Startup Nation, you are back with uh, the Startup Life here, Dominic Lawson, KWM The Voice. Uh, so we're talking to Tony Pergolin, CEO and president of Bancroft. Uh, so, Tony, I want to ask you this because, you know, I was reading an article about you from the Philadelphia Inquirer from a few years ago, and it mm-hmm. talked about, you know, um, you know, the anxiety and the nervousness of the staff and everything, because I guess at this point there there's, there's like, there comes a point where they start to kind of understand the gravity of the situation. Right. And so Correct. you said, quote, what I really made it a point to do was to be visible. I'd be out in the programs. I'd be talking to staff. We had family meetings, end quote. And you talked about that a bo- in the book a little bit, but you also talked about not being too visible, not being out there too much. Kind of talk about, you know, uh, kind of at the same, you know, um, having that being out there and being present to calm the staff, but also not to be out there too much. Kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, because I do think that there's a balance, you know, especially in the beginning. I was so consumed in the work that I was doing that I almost didn't have the time, which, you know, isn't a great excuse, but it was kind of reality. Gotcha. But then I learned that, you know, I, it came clear to me that nobody really knew just like what was how bad it was. Right. And, you know, if you, you can't, you know, and people, so, and, and there were signs, right? So things like before I got here, they would get, they would be given a paycheck on a Friday and the pay department would say, now don't cash it till Monday. Okay. So there were signs mm-hmm, right. <laughs> that we were having problems, right. right? But nobody really understood it. And what they also did, they, they thought, well, we're having financial problems. The finance company, the finance department will fix it. Mm. And the reality is, is the finance turnarounds do not happen in the finance department. The finance department is kind of like the scorekeeper of what happens in the operation, right? So it was people out on the programs making decisions like, you know, how much money should we spend when we buy this? How much money should we spend when we buy this? Should we, you know, how many staff we should have? Are we spending overtime? Are we scheduling overtime? All those decisions really impact the profit and loss statement. That right. really determines if a company... So if those people don't know that they're losing money, they're spending more that they have, then nothing will change, right? So they have to change their behavior that you have to educate them about it. So that was when I realized, you know what, I got to get out there a little bit and really start educating people on we're spending, it's almost like we're spending money without anybody ever looking in their checkbook, right? I I brought it back to them. If you never looked in your checkbook, you would go out to dinner every night, you would go shopping every day, but you don't do that because you know how much money you have. And so I really had to spend time educating people on that. And then once we turned around and, and were stabilized, then I wanted to go out and be a part of the program and, and have, you know, really learn from the people. Because I think everybody was nervous that a right. CFO was going to be their CEO because all I was going to care about was the numbers. And I wanted to show them that I cared about the work they were doing and the important work that they were doing. And I wanted to hear from them. What else do you need? So there was that balance of, you know, educating them and then being a leader that was a listener that was really important for them. So I, I just felt like there's a balance of when you can be out and what your purpose of is being 
you know, throughout the organization. For sure. For sure. And that's definitely something uh, business leaders, business owners and nonprofit leaders can definitely learn from for sure. The book is Too Important to Fail, Leadership Lessons for Nonprofits. You can get that anywhere you get your favorite books or Amazon uh, and everywhere else in between. So I wanted to ask you this because you were talking about, you know, just now and in the book about how, you know, cash was precarious at best. And you was also talking about, you know, uh, uh, how people were told not to cash their checks, you know, uh, until Monday, things of that nature. And your book really kind of made me laugh and cry at the same time, because <laughs> as an entrepreneur as well, I know the 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 uh, the uh, the fun it is to uh, go to the mailbox uh, from day to day when, <laughs> when cash is a serious issue. Uh, but I want to talk about this because there's a certain family uh, that came to the aid of Bancroft time and time again that, you know, was very pivotal in the turnaround, maybe even pivotal, pivotal in keeping the doors open. Kind of talk about Raymond and Joanne Welsh and how important yeah. they are to the Bancroft story. They are critically um, an important part of the story. Well, right. While I certainly led the turnaround, they really allowed me the time to do it. That, that's really how I look at it. So um, Ray and Joanne had a son at Bancroft for about 13 years, and they were so grateful of the work that um, – and, and the life that Bancroft provided to their son, Randy, that they wanted to be more and more involved. And they had the means, and they wanted to help other people to ensure that Bancroft was doing the same thing for for their children as, as Bancroft was doing for Randy. Now, by the time I got here, Randy had already passed away. Right. He had um, an aneurysm. But, you know, a lot of times when family members, you know, um, children are no longer here, then they aren't either. You know? they just move on to the next thing, but not Ray and Joanne. They remained committed to Bancroft, even though their son was no longer receiving, you know, receiving services from us. They were so committed to the other individuals that they, that they remained very involved. Ray was on our board and Ray was a part of my recruitment getting here because Ray had worked, he's on the board member of the health system that I spoke about. And he was committed to, he, he believed in me and he said, listen, I'm going to make a significant donation. He made a $3 million donation when I arrived to help right. me, be, you know, help the organization turn around. And then he gave me uh, about, a, you know, um, maybe eight months in, he gave me a $3 million loan that I was, you know, I have to say the day we repaid that loan, it was an interest-free loan for us. I right. felt so good because without him, truly we would not be where we are. So we were thrilled to name our new campus after Ray and Joanne because I felt that their name should be set in this organization for as long as it's here because we wouldn't be here without them. For sure. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. Now, Startup Nation, as you know, business leaders, entrepreneurs, nonprofit leaders and stuff like that, we try to do everything we can to keep you know, uh, the boat afloat, keep the doors open and everything like that. But sometimes there, you know, there just comes a time where there are things that happen that affect our business or organization where it's just out of our control. And so, Tony, tell us about the time where, you know, you're 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 turning around Bancroft and, you know, you know, you're, you're closing down certain programs, stuff like that. One in particular in Louisiana is getting ready to sell that program. And then a certain life event happened. Kind of talk about that a little bit. Yes, I'll never forget that. We had finally gotten um, a buyer. And, you know, it was important to us that, you know, we had to divest some of these programs that were not cash flowing and that were not local because right. we were spending a lot of money just going down there. And so, you know, and I didn't want to just close those up. So I was thrilled that we had, a, had a, you know, somebody who was, um, who wanted to take it over and, and I could assure a soft landing for the individuals we serve. And we're just getting ready to do it. And Hurricane Katrina hits. Mm. And, you know, we're in New Jersey, so we don't really um, uh, experience those kind of weather events uh, right. nearly as, as often or as nearly as bad as, as Louisiana. Right. Well, I, I just couldn't believe it. And there was damage done to the, um, you know, to the facilities, and there was all kinds of, um, you know, problems we had to deal with. But luckily... There was 
insurance money that, you know, of course was, you know, in place way before I came, that was truly helpful for us. So we could, you know, really continue to make that happen and and invest in in some of the areas that we need to. But it, it really made me realize that all the planning in the world sometimes, you know, is completely out of your hands when, when, you know, things like that happen. And as a leader, you got to be prepared. You really have to be prepared. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. We are talking to Tony Pergolin, CEO and president of Bancroft. Really quick question before we go to break really quickly, because a lot of times Startup Nation, uh, sometimes when we have to uh, rally the troops in our organization and stuff like that, we inspire our, our team members, we inspire our staff and things of that nature. But sometimes it requires us to inspire other people. So, Tony, when you were you know uh, talking about scaling the, uh, Bancroft and opening new facilities for Bancroft and stuff like that, there's a story about the construction company that was helping with this that was very fascinating to me and how they kind of chipped in to help. Kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, we were, um, that, 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 that was a great story. So we, uh, you know, we had tons, there, uh, there was 200 construction workers a day on the site um, in its in its height, so there was a lot of work. And you know, my development officers said, you know, listen, I mean, what we'd like to do is reach out to all the different subcontractors and companies that are working on the project to see if they would want to be a part of our capital campaign. So we had a twelve million dollar capital campaign going on, um, and it was really important that we raised all twelve million to be able to make this financially work. So we wanted to reach out to everybody, and so we reached out to the. Um, the project manager on the team, and we said, could you give us the, the contact information for all the people working on this? And he said, you know what? Why don't you let me do it? Because I know them. You know, you don't. Right. And I know, you know, like what's important to them. So let me kind of manage this. Well, we were a little nervous, to be honest with you, because we were like, well, you know, this is what we do, and we, we want to pull on their heartstrings and all this. And he said, let me take care of it. I said, Okay. So on we went, and we you know did our other fundraising. And when we were kind of getting close to the financing, we again had gone through another um, you know uh, issue with one of our programs. We were having some financial problems again, mm-hmm. and I was very nervous about ending the fiscal year. So we end in June, June thirtieth, and that we weren't going to be able to make some of our covenants that our new partners who were financing the project um, you know had expected. And I was talking to the project manager about. You know, I didn't want to go too into it, but he said, you know, I could tell that, you know, you're you're struggling a little bit just, you know, in, in your demeanor. Is there anything I can do to help? And I said, well, you know, you mentioned that you were going to, you didn't mind reaching out to the, you know, the, the companies that are working on the project. If there's anything you can do before June 30th, it would be really helpful. And that was all I said. And on June 29th, he handed me a check for $275,000, wow. which was way above what we had ever anticipated. Right. And the timing couldn't have been better. And it was that check that really helped us hit all of our covenants. And we were able to move forward with financing. So, you know, sometimes, again, there's things out of your control that, you know, you're you're grateful to have um, people who understand your mission and, and want to be a part of it. Uh, who can really help you move forward. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing all of that. So we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. And when we come back, I'm going to ask Tony about some of the leadership styles that she talks about in her book. You're listening to The Startup Life on KWM The Voice, 107.9 FM. Startup Nation. We tell you all the time that no one does anything great on their own. That includes starting a business or a nonprofit or even becoming a thought leader or an influencer. My point is that you need a team to do it successfully and responsibly. And that is why you should contact DR and Associates. Danielle and her team provide branding solutions along with digital and social media marketing that provide tangible results you are looking for. No matter if you are a Fortune 500 company or an author looking to make an impact, DR and Associates needs to be part of your team. They are one of the few firms whose leadership has been recognized by Google, which is proof of concept that they are very good at what they do. Contact DR and Associates today to grow your online presence. The number is 615-933-3681 or you can visit their website at drandassociates.com. Also, make sure you follow their Facebook page as well, DR and Associates, providing real clients with real results. 
This episode of The Startup Life is also brought to you by our amazing partners at SCORE Memphis. Look, entrepreneurship is hard, and there is nothing like a mentor that can help you navigate those waters. And that is what SCORE provides. SCORE mentors provide years of expertise and have resources that will have you flourishing and profitable on your path to entrepreneurship. If you are in need of a mentor, give SCORE a call. The number is 901-544-3588 or go to their website at memphis.score.org. The link is there in the show notes. Startup Nation, Kenda and I, along with our daughter Zoe, have this thing called Target Fridays if she's had a good week at school. We stop by the snack bar for popcorn and mermaid ices. Startup Nation, don't judge me until you've tried them. Those ices are really good. Anyways, we then head over to the toy section so my daughter can add to her LOL doll collection. My daughter is a pretty good student, so you can imagine that we have spent a small fortune on LOL dolls. However, I can take solace in the fact that Target makes it affordable to buy those LOL dolls and anything else we need as a family. That's because Target believes you deserve quality at an affordable price. And when you're entrepreneurs like us, That's extremely important. But great deals and quality products are not exclusive to the brick-and-mortar version of the retail store. Target.com has even more exclusive deals that you can appreciate. And when you spend over $35, shipping is free. And I know we all love free shipping. We love to purchase the amazing kids' clothes for Zoe from the exclusive to Target Cat and Jack line when we go online. So the next time you listen to the show and you are reminded that you need something for your home, Start your Target journey with the link in our show notes, where you can expect more and pay less. Welcome back to The Startup Life. We are talking to Tony Pergolin, President and CEO of Bancroft. So, Tony, I want to ask you this, because in your book, you talk about the three different types of leadership styles that nonprofits uh, should use. Kind of talk about that a little bit. So, you know, people often ask me about, you know, well, what kind of leadership style do you need to run a nonprofit? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that it's not just one, and, and really in any company. I mean, as a leader, you really need to have a variety of styles that you can use throughout the different challenges and the different, you know, issues that are brought up to you. And so when I think about what what I had accomplished over the years at Bancroft through the turnaround, through the growth, and through the building the new school. I, I, I narrowed it down to three leadership styles that I thought uh, were most influential. And I would say the strongest was servant leadership. Mm. And servant leadership is really that you take it away from yourself and, and you really serve for the mission of the organization or, in Bancroft's case, the people we serve. And I felt like I used that um, the most because it allows you to kind of separate yourself from decisions and almost think about every decision as its impact on the people that we serve. And I think in nonprofits, that's really critical for the leader to really understand that, you know, it's not, you know, kind of your personal agenda, but instead it's truly for the people that we serve. The second one I talk about is transformational leadership, and and this is, you know, at at a much broader perspective, because I truly had to transform the organization over time, and, you know, Bancroft went from a $75 $75 million company, which, you know, is still a, a nice size, but they had this kind of mom and pop feeling. And, you know, they, they operated like a family. They operated, you know, on a shoestring budget. And they were almost comfortable being poor. Mm-hmm. You know, it was kind of their excuse for everything. It was like, well, you know, we don't have a lot of money. So, you know, people would bring in, you know, paper towels from home and pens from home. And as you grow in a nonprofit world anyway, Way, you need to move into a more professional type environment because that's how you recruit more professional type people that bring, you know, um, a, a business acumen and technology acumen and you know right. really some important skill sets. Like you have to be able to operate like a professional company. And it was interesting to me that it was it was harder to do that internally because it was almost more comfortable to, for them to say like, oh, we're so poor. It was like an excuse. And I really really use transformational leadership to help them understand the value for the organization if we can move into a more professional type um, uh, atmosphere. And then the final one I would say is transactional. And and this I would um, I, I think is critically important for any leader because while you 
don't ever want to get in the weeds, right? Because that's what you have your team for and you delegate for and you want to stay big picture. Right. When you, you know, I often tell my team, like, you know, I look at the organization from the trees, you know, I, 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 I see the whole big picture. But sometimes when you're in the trees, you can see that there's um, some some smoke ahead, right in a certain area where something may not be going right. You know, and you know, we I spend a lot of time looking at KPIs and dashboards, and when some of your indicators start going the wrong way, and you know, I'll tell you from from the turnaround, I never take my eye off cash, still to this day, right. So when you see things like oh, cash is kind of declining, whatever, you got to be able to get in, and that's where the transition transactional leadership comes in. So I go down, I really spend time with the team to understand what's happening, what the barriers are, um, and really kind of help them push through it. The important part of transactional leadership is you got to know when to go down and you got to know when to come back up. Yeah. And and I think that's critical for any leader. But I I you know there's it's more than one leadership style. And when I think back, it, for, for me it was it was all three that I think helped me achieve what I did. I hear that, and and nav- knowing when to navigate it at the certain at the particular point in time you need it is also, I imagine, is important as well. Exactly, for sure, exactly. for sure. I mean, things take time, and you've got to be able to plan for that time. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, Tony, you also talk about, and you talk about in the book, uh, and you talk about in other writings and stuff like that. You talk about how nonprofits need to be okay with running them like for profits, and you talk about uh, the quote, uh, "No margin, no mission." Kind of talk about that a little bit. Yes, it's my favorite and Mm -hmm. something that I think that people don't really understand. They think, you know, when I would tell people I'm a CEO of a nonprofit, they would say like, oh, that's so nice. You don't even have to make money. (laughs) Right. I was like, what? I mean, people really (laughs) believe that because of, of of the name, not profit. They're like, oh, you don't have to make a profit. And so I really tried to educate both internally and externally about no margin, no mission, meaning if we cannot run this business like a business, and have a margin, then we will not have a mission. Like people get very ingrained in like, well, this is our mission. We have to do it. But if we can't be profitable at providing that service, then we won't be here to provide that service. And, you know, all the profit that we make, you know, helps us pay our bills. It helps us give raises. It helps us, you know, improve our facilities. I mean, that profit that we make is how we invest back into the organization, back into our staff, back into our facilities, back into our technology. And if we don't have it, we will not be here. And so I really spent a lot of time on that no margin, no mission, so that people understand that you have to have both to be a successful organization in the nonprofit world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And before I ask the last question, Tony, I just want to say once again, thank you so much for coming on the Startup Life, uh, powered by KWAM, The Voice, AM 990, 107.9 uh, FM. Uh, you gave amazing uh, you know, thoughts and and. and uh, and stuff like that about, you know, nonprofit work, leadership, how to, you know, stand in the face of adversity and and, and really turn around, uh, you know, your organization. And in your case, Bancroft twice, if, you know, in yeah. that regard. <laughs> so for sure. And once again, Startup Nation, the book is Too Important to Fail, Leadership Lessons for Nonprofit. You can get there, in, nonprofits, you can get that anywhere you get your favorite books. And we also have, if you're listening to the replay on the podcast, we have the show notes, uh, the link there in the show notes for easy access. But really quickly, really quickly, Tony, if you would, there's a nonprofit leader out there that's feeling stuck. They're feeling, you know, they they have cash as a precarious situation themselves, stuff like that. (laughs) Kind of give them some words of motivation before we head out for today. You know, I would tell them to never give up. There are so many times in my journey that I thought, this is too hard. I can't do it. There's, you know, I, I don't, I don't know how to make the next step. And I just kept pushing because I so believed in the organization. And I just want to encourage everybody that there are answers out there. There are people who want to help you and don't be afraid to reach out to them. Never give up. And you will be so grateful that you didn't. For sure. For sure. And that's going to wrap up our time here on the Startup Life. Thank you again uh, so much, Tony, for your time. And once again, Startup Nation, uh, we'll have uh, um, the replay on the podcast side for sure. And as always, if you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life. 